It's not an exaggeration to say that Robert Wise's The Setup features some of the best direction in classic Hollywood. It's a masterclass in sustaining mood, directing actors, and using the camera to tell a continuous, flowing narrative of inevitability. In this story of an aging boxer who defies his manager and refuses to take a dive, Wise sees everything. Every nook and cranny of the exquisite production design, every nuance in the charged dialogue, every psychologically complex glance. His camera carries the weight of the setting, the shades of noir, the literal and figurative life of the characters. The setup takes place in and around a boxing arena and makes the most out of its limited setting, using it as a microcosm to illustrate the corruption that plagued the sport. By ruthlessly delving into boxing's socioeconomics, the film delivers a larger and scathing critique of a country so often sold as a capitalistic utopia. In the setup sleazy world, everybody's money hungry and everybody does whatever it takes to get a payday. And that's rooted in a deep desire for destruction and a deep desire for violence. Noir has always been an insightful vehicle for the exploration of the ethos of male violence and Wise's film is no exception. In it, Stoker, played to perfection by Robert Ryan, one of the greats, can only gain his self-respect by bleeding, by being bruised, by punching and being punched. It's a matter of masculinity, of showing to himself and to the world that he can take it, that he can carry the weight of wounds around and still be there for the next fight. In Stoker's world, violence is poetics, self-expression, a defiance of the divine. Incidentally, the violence also looks and feels incredible. Its texture, full of evocative details and vividly stark black and white photography. You can see its influence on Hitchcock, Kubrick and Scorsese, just to name a few of the um, heavyweights, so to speak. If, for instance, Stoker's I-1, I-1 line towards the end of the film echoes decades later in Scorsese's Raging Bull. I won tonight. I won. You never got me down. You hear me? Never got me down. This is what great cinema does so well and so often. It recycles itself throughout the years, but never loses its power. It expands and consumes, it reflects society back to us, it creates attachments that run deeper than we even realize. All in all, the setup is a masterclass in storytelling and one of the great gems of classic Hollywood. It's a total knockout. Want to make a statement? Boys tell me I did a couple of murders. Anything in it? It might come as a surprise to most, but the truth is that there aren't many film noirs featuring private detectives, and half of those that do exist are based on Raymond Chandler novels. One of the best is Murder My Sweet. Directed by Canadian-born Edward Dmitryk and starring song and dance extraordinaire Dick Powell, the film follows iconic detective Philip Marlowe as he gets roped in a complex tale of mystery and deceit. As with most noirs, the starting point matters little. Someone needs someone else to look into something and that's pretty much it. It's what follows that becomes so intriguing, the idea that there are layers to everything and everyone, and if you're just a bit curious, just a bit patient, just a bit entrepreneurial, you'll be able to peel them. It's the cinematic equivalent of Winston Churchill's quote, it's a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma, but perhaps there is a key. It's that last part, the key part, that makes noir so enticing and so dangerous. The uncovering of fucked up truths which most of the time are merely confirmation that the protagonist's cynicism was merited, that life needs to be lived with constant mistrust of the fellow man and the institutions that serve him. The film adapts Chandler's novel Farewell My Lovely and remains fairly faithful to the original text, down to the writer's trademark hard-boiled dialogue. What are you doing at the office, Adelaide? I'm a homing pigeon. I always come back to the stinking coop no matter how late it is. The Matrix film is hyper-stylized and despite the complex plotting, there's a cool vibe permeating throughout, even when the stakes are high. This is in no small part thanks to Dimitrix's work behind the camera, alongside his trustworthy cinematographer Harry J. Wilde. There's a case to be made that both men contributed greatly to advancing the visual language of film noir, a product of their inventive camera work and strikingly expressionistic photography. Aside from being a pleasure to look at, it also prevents the film from being too self-serious, drawing the viewer in when the plotting becomes too confusing. The other draw is Dick Powell. 
Powell, who is primarily known for his various roles in MGM musicals, transformed his frothy image in one swoop by taking the Marlowe role, a controversial move at the time. He wasn't seen as tough as Humphrey Bogart or Robert Mitchum, and audiences were still attached to his musical days. Still, Dmitry was one of the biggest proponents of Powell's performance, saying that Marlowe can be physically strong, but there's something soft inside about him. That's what makes Dick Powell the best of all the Philip Marlowe's. Almost eight decades later, there's still an undeniable charm and appeal to the film's pulpy and hard-boiled qualities. The suspense is built up sharply and quickly and the storytelling is smart and gripping without ever losing its cynical and very humorous edge. For lighter fare that still quenches the noir thirst, Murder My Sweet is the perfect film. Fred Zinnemann's 1948 act of violence tells the story of former prisoner of war Frank Henley, a loving husband, father, and building constructor who's hailed as a World War II hero in the California town of Santa Lisa. His life takes a big turn with the arrival of Joe Parkson, who knows a shameful secret from their time together at a Nazi concentration camp. What follows is a psychologically complex and bleak game of cat and mouse that culminates into what must certainly be one of the darkest sequences of Hollywood's golden age. Act of Violence came right after The Search, starring Montgomery Clift and The Man, which introduced Marlon Brando to the world and marked the first time that Zinnemann felt the confidence he knew what he was doing and why he was doing it. Those are his words, straight from his autobiography, and they ring true. The film is expertly crafted and every decision is full of intention, always serving a wider thematic exploration. Zinnemann designs clever twists and turns rooted in the complex psychology of his characters, giving the film a constant sense of unease and unpredictability. At first glance, act of violence may not seem to tick all the noir boxes, but soon enough it grabs a hold of the darkness, the despair, and the grittiness with all its cynically laden might. The film openly addresses the wounds of World War II and casts a spotlight on the emptiness and hypocrisy of post-war optimism in a booming suburban America. It's especially ascetic given that it confronts trauma at a time that the country was focused on reconstruction. And that's one of the main reasons the film didn't perform at the box office. Moviegoers simply weren't ready to be confronted with the grim truths behind the shiny, fragile facade of their new America. The other reason is that act of violence is framed around the complex moral dilemma, dealing with issues of heavy repression and personal accountability in the face of dark secrets. Frank has to contend with a downfall from a difficult moral choice and face Joe, who functions as a sort of angel of death. In one way or another, both men have to confront the essence of Schopenhauer's acerbic observation of morality. It is a strange the man on a moralist that he should commend no other virtue than that which he himself possesses. None of them are truly who they say or pretend they are, and in it lives the truth of noir. Aside from Zinnemann's visual prowess and command over the medium, it's also worth highlighting the terrific acting by the main players. Robert Ryan delivers a fascinating and complex performance which could even be described as modern. Of all the classic Hollywood actors, he's perhaps the most intriguing and one of the few that were truly ahead of the curve in terms of where film acting was going. But Act of Violence also sees Van Heflin at his best, maybe his very best, who makes the most out of the juicy and heady role he's given. Janet Leigh and Mary Astor, two movie stars with immense screen presence, provide emotional anchors, but they're also utterly gripping every time they're on screen, often stealing scenes from their male counterparts. Watching Act of Violence today is an experience like no other. The medium has evolved, to be sure, but there's something dangerous, almost transgressive about Zinnemann's film. In his autobiography, the filmmaker wrote, Personally, I like this picture very much. It would still be of interest to today's audience, as I'm sure. The theme is a permanent one. He's right, Act of Violence manages to wrap an intriguing mystery and deeply nuanced characters and develop them both satisfyingly in just 80 minutes. It's a miracle of a film. <laughs> 